Thank you for auditing the always positive New Music Review Show hosted by a French professor whose eyes still hurt because he spent 10 minutes this morning looking at the cover of King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard's new album, Butterfly 3000. And apparently if you look at the cover and cross your eyes, like a butterfly pops out in stereoscopic 3D. It had the sum effect of me just kind of hurting my eyes. Uh, I'm gonna be reviewing King Gizzard again, and this is the third time I'm reviewing them. And it's kind of a fun experiment that I'm doing. You see, uh, I am the Rip Van Winkle of pop music. I went to sleep in 2002, and I woke up in 2018. So I missed the whole beginning of King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. And I've reviewed their last two albums, and I've really enjoyed them, and I've asked people, you know, what should I listen to of their old catalog, but I haven't done it. And so I think I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm doing the same thing with Weezer, with Tame Impala, with a bunch of other great rock bands, where I'm just moving forward. I am certain that their previous music is great and is amazing. But it's, an ama it's a very fun idea to just say, I only know King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard from 2018 plus. And I can tell you, just by reviewing these three albums, sorry, there's a chipmunk on the porch. I can, uh, reviewing these three albums, that wasn't a secret code. <laughs> there literally was a chipmunk on the porch. Uh, just reviewing these three albums is helping me to see what a great band they are. And really, um, they are one of the best bands in the world. And by that, I don't mean they're one of the best music acts in the world. I don't know if I'd put them that high. But as far as like a band of musicians playing together, wow, is this a good band. I do have a message for you, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Make your music easier to buy. <laughs> I would have bought KG, I would have bought LW, but I can't find it. I don't know how to get it. So anyways, I, I don't know. It's just, it's funny because I'm happy they keep releasing new albums because that's a way for me to keep listening to their music. And this new one, Butterfly 3000, is really nice because it's a total shift from the previous two albums, which were, as I, as I foresaw them, being very influenced by North African music, uh, being very uh, interestingly microtonal with the way they're making here, this music is all seems to be based on playing around with a synthesizer, playing around with arpeggiators on a keyboard. Just playing around with that. It reminds me of like commercials in the 1980s for ITT, Technical Institute, or like music that you might hear at a planetarium. And even the title, Butterfly 3000, has that kind of futuristic feel. But of course we have this bizarre fact where anything that Futuristic music is retro. So uh, it sounds like futuristic music from the 80s, which thereby makes it sound retro, right? The same way if you go to Disney uh, and you go to their kind of future town or whatever they call it, it all looks like the 1950s vision of the 2000s. Uh, that's what this soundscape is. The music of the future is now retro. The, the main thing I don't understand about King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard besides how fun it is to say their name, the main thing I don't understand is how are they such an enjoyable band? How is their music so catchy? Take this album as an example. The, the arpeggiated and automated keyboards, as a musician, stress me out because I think if there's a musician who has to play along, they have to be very well synced. And sometimes they are synced and sometimes they're not. Sometimes the drums, guitar, and bass are playing at other rhythms, creating some kind of polyrhythm. They often change time signatures. It is so complicated and uh, technically and technologically precise that it shouldn't be enjoyable. It, it should be the way I feel listening to a lot of prog rock where like, I'm like, okay, cool, but I don't really enjoy it. This album is filled with beautiful, catchy melodies. It's like a really fun album to listen to. Yet you get so into it that you can't quite figure it out and it's so complicated. It really is, an, it really is quite an impressive feat. I think they did that with their last two albums as well, but it's a little bit less enjoyable, I think, just because there's a certain aggression to the sounds that they were using to those microtones that didn't make it kind of relaxed. Whereas I can listen to this album and I can be relaxed and I can be excited. So my homework for you, for every album, I give you a homework song, an example to listen to. I'll put a link to it up there. Please go and watch, come back here and watch the rest of the video. I'm just gonna go with the first song. I could have picked others, but the first song is a good example, yours. Immediately they set up with, a, it's, it's, you know, it's a kind of a thesis statement of a first song. It's just, the question is, you know, what makes a good arpeggiated keyboard line? 
because really, if you don't know, you know, like there's like a button on a keyboard and you press it and it says, you know, loop or whatever. And you sort of play something and it'll play it on that loop. It's hard to know how to do it well. And sometimes it feels as though all of the good arpeggiated keyboard lines were written in the late 70s and early 80s. I'm thinking particularly of Kraftwerk or Kraftwerk. But this one is just a great example of how it can be used so beautifully. It's like a descending, like the, the, the keyboard's descending with these little notes that also go up high, uh, almost like a, almost like an interesting fugue subject from Bach, you know, like a Bach. I might as well pronounce things properly in German today. Kratwerk and Bach, uh, you know, like so it descends, but this little extra high note up there is so nice. It's arpeggiated and it sounds electronic, but then there's real drums. King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. I have not looked up the members of your of your band. I don't know who you are. Find the drummer and give him a raise. Just, I don't care what he gets, give him more money. I don't know how he's able to play. I used to be in a band, sometimes we'd do things with the keyboard and I'd have to stay synced and it would just be very difficult. He does beautiful fills. Uh, I don't know if this is like a trend now with drummers, but most of his fills are just one drum at a time. That kind of thing, it's just great. It just keeps the energy so high and just all these things keep going. You know, like the song just keeps building. As the chorus kind of starts going, uh, there's like this, the keyboard starts kind of blaring and getting su su some sustain, su 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 studio, some sustain on the, on the keyboard. And then the rhythm changes slightly in the first verse and just gets really funky. It's some of my favorite kind of music, what I call the complicated head nod, okay? So music where you're just like, yeah, but there's something rhythmically where you're not quite able to catch up to it. There's some kind of rhythmic thing that happens here. And that's what's happening in this song. But then it's just so catchy that you just sing along with it. Do, 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 do. And then they have their characteristic woo in the song, which just gets you so excited. And each musician in the band, as far as I can tell, gets a time to shine throughout the entire song, right? So before one of the verses or choruses, a guitarist has a little guitar solo that has a little back and forth with a, with a keyboard solo. And then the bass starts to go wild after that. Listen carefully to the bass in that second verse. And then even the drummer gets some time to play out the drum and have it extend a bit. The whole band is there. They all need to be there. Each member is totally essential. Whenever you make electronic music with a band, the hardest thing I think that a lot of bands don't get right is how do you make sure that the band is essential? The, the best example, I think, is Radiohead. If you've ever seen them in concert, the band is 100% essential. If one member was different, the whole band would be terrible yet it can be so led by these electronic elements. It's really quite nice. Lyrically, this is the strength and the weakness of the band. I don't know. I like the singer, but most often I don't really get what his lyrics are. Uh, hey, he's your man in the sky, your blue butterfly. There's butterflies all over the place on this album. That seems to be the main theme, not just hurting my eyes. Um, according to an interview with him that I read on Genius, quote, I'm just gonna have to read this like a stoner, I'm sorry. This record is written from the... I can't do an Australian stoner voice. This record is written from the perspective of someone watching over you who's like the dream god. Like, maybe it's Morpheus, the Greek god of sleep. The butterfly is a good omen on this record. I suppose that's what this song is about. <laughs> so, you know, what does all that mean? It doesn't mean much. It seems as though this is an album, which is very interesting. A lot of the thematics are about COVID. A lot of thematics are about butterflies and metamorphosis and changing, and that's neat, but it's not very cohesive. I don't really get the idea they're saying something very concrete. I get the sense they're saying lots of things that sort of mean something, like a butterfly being a good omen. Mm. But that's okay. That's not, that's not why I listen to it. Fundamentally, the way I think about this band is the way I think about a band like The Grateful Dead. The lyrics may not be great, the singing may not be great, but the musicianship and the way the musicians play together is so great that you just have to love it. In that way, I guess they're like a jam band, except um, nine-tenths of all jam bands are unlistenable, right? So when you find a good jam band, like The Grateful Dead, for example, and a few others, it's a really nice experience to listen to this kind of musicianship working and playing even if it gets a little hippy-dippy. Next track is called Shanghai. Uh, oh, please subscribe to my channel uh, and smash the like bucket. I forgot to ask. I'm supposed to ask these things.
My producer told me to do that. I'm my, I'm my own producer. I told me to do that. Next song is called Shanghai. Again, kind of weird scales, tying back a little bit with KGLW. You get the sense that they're just writing everything on the black notes on the, on the piano. He sings with the melody, which is nice. I can't quite tell what he's singing, something about a butterfly. I'll get into that later. Really nice, mellow drumming. And someone else is doing some singing on here as well. Cool kind of blaring synthesizers. And at the end, there's like this section where they're playing with the keyboard. Now, if you've ever had a keyboard, you know, like, like a good modern synthesizer, it is really fun just to like play. They have all these knobs that change all the sounds. And this, you just get the sense that that's what they're doing. They're just and they're just kind of playing with it. It's really nice. Um, I guess the lyrics are the most catchy on this song than on anything else because you can hear them clearly. Bye bye Shanghai, I've become a butterfly. Which according to the interview is about the metamorphosis of travel. Doesn't matter. It's not particularly good and that doesn't particularly matter. It leads perfectly into the next song. The whole album leads just beautifully together. Uh, it feels like it's just one long album. It leads into the song called Dreams. Now, I gave you yours as homework, but Dreams is, the only thing, I, the only way I could say is it's my jammy jam. I love this song. Like, I've listened to this album four or five times now, and every time this comes on, I just get so happy. It is such a good song. Tell, tell me. In the comments, I'm, I also, the producer also told me to ask for more call-outs. What is your jammy jam on this album? I don't know how it's not Dreams, because this song, the drummer is just going so hard. These crazy off beats, he like matches and veers a little bit from the arpeggiator. The synthesizer is just washing over. Some of the nicest, clearest lyrics, I only wanna wake up in my dreams. I only feel awake at night. I only feel tired during the day. Very clear, just sort of that weird, fog of quarantine that we've been in but there's this bit where like the drummer is playing so you know a ride cymbal you know it's a cymbal and in the middle there's a, a bell and the bell makes that ding ding sound as opposed to it it's the ding ding the just the way the drummer whatever his name i apologize for not knowing your name whatever his name is he the way or he or she how am i supposed to know i don't i don't know the genders of anyone in this band, he or she is playing this bell just so well. Just like, it's just so funky and so in sync and just that crazy complicated head nod, right? It reminds me oddly of the breakdown section in Michael Jackson's Beat It, which was sort of my introduction as a kid to how funk music could make you feel, you know? How like a funky beat, some kind of weird syncopated like badass sound could feel. It reminds me of that. Uh, so really, it's just a great, a great song. It is absolutely my favorite song on the album. It is my jammy jam. Am I gonna regret using that term? I might. I better have a sip of coffee. Next track is called Blue Morpho, which is a kind of butterfly. Um, and another perfect segue from the previous one. What's cool here is this features a keyboard that has a slight dip in it, like, like kind of like a weird sort of dissonant or sound, which you heard once in Dreams. So it feels as though this song is actually just part two of Dreams. And again, the drummer is still doing interesting uh, work with the bell, right? And just beautiful fills. There's just this really uh, hard to describe jam in the middle there with this cool like, s like scale being used. It sounds like by the guitarist. And do I hear a, st a string section? Did, I, I don't know, please tell me. Did I hear a string section for like three seconds in this one song and nowhere else on the album? Uh, and it's, again, it seems to be about dreams and about needing to wake up and this kind of general themes. We lead into the next track, Interior People, which is definitively not one of my jammy jams. It's one of my least favorite tracks on the album, although it is good. It has a lot of good things to it. Very interesting piano sounds on here. This reminds me a little bit more of the previous album, a very cool instrumental bit. One of the better instrumental bits on the album, so it's not like I dislike this song. Again, just some more great drum work. Um, this is about COVID, you know, about being the gap of death. I no longer fear the interior people. At times, the way the lyrics are delivered and the way they sound remind me unfavorably of Rush. <sighs> sorry, that was just the sound of all those downvotes. I'm sorry, I, I respect Rush, and in some ways I love them, but I don't enjoy listening to them. And a lot of the reason why is the way that their lyrics are delivered 
and the way that, I don't mean the voice, his voice is great, but the way that sometimes the words feel kind of like forced in and thrown in on top and just feels kind of a unrelenting, unpleasant cascade of kind of goofy lyrics. Uh, I get that feeling here. We get to the next track, Catching Smoke, which is almost my jammy jam. I'll explain to you why it's not. Uh, musically, it is so cool. <laughs> it has like these, these automated back notes descending, and then this is the thing. I love it when music has rhythmic elements that are hard to predict. So there's a thumping bass drum in here. And I did it with the kids. I'm like, can you predict when it's gonna make dum, dum, the dum, 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 the dum, dum, that kind of thing? Ah, oh, it's so cool. It's so much fun. If you are a fan or if you've never heard the song, like find it and just listen along because it's, it's the rhythmic complexity of this band that is just so great. It gets really, really funky with the pre-chorus where the drums actually become almost like straightforward. But then all this other stuff is happening and then you get the woo. Okay, now what's, what's, my, what's my problem with the song? My problem with the song is lyrical. If you've been a, a fan of this channel for a while, you know I am straight edge. Uh, I have maybe one drink a month and that's about it. Uh, I've never done drugs. So songs that are about drugs kind of bum me out. Now this song is about drugs, I don't know. I'll get a half and everyone's catching smoke, whatever. I I'm old enough now that I don't care <laughs> as much that people do drugs and I'm not like, you know, if you drink, you're not a man. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not that stuff. Um, but it does kind of reduce the impact of a song. If it's like this, which according to him is a hedonist anthem, which is just another way of like, dude, do drugs. But that's fine. But that, that kind of takes it away. But I want to add a caveat to that. Um, I, I, apparently they're going on tour and they are playing a show in Red Rocks, Colorado. And uh, as a Grateful Dead fan, uh, on July 8th, 1978, and I believe again sometime in 1985, the Grateful Dead played a concert at Red Rocks in Colorado. Absolutely legendary shows. This is a legendary venue, and I'm thinking, you know, it made me think like, I would love to see this band in Colorado. And I realized if I went to see the band in Colorado, I'd just be just like I was back again watching Grateful Dead shows. You know, I went to 20 Grateful Dead shows before Jerry Garcia died, and you know, I loved it. And I was there straight as an arrow totally uptight and everyone thought I was a narc and I, everyone would pass me the joint and I wouldn't even touch the damn thing and that whole thing and I wasn't tripping and I wasn't on shrooms, but nobody in that whole goddamn stadium was more into the music than me, okay? I was sitting there and flipping around and doing the druggy dance and smelling like onion pizza just like everybody else, okay? But I did it without drugs. And so that's my fundamental thing of why I'm so thankful that music like this exists. Because it's okay. It's okay that people do drugs. It's okay that I don't. It's okay that this music is here because whatever it is, whatever that, that thing is that people get from music this good, played by musicians this good with these weird trippy themes up against the mountains of Colorado and everyone's just feeling a good vibe, I feel it. Me, some dude in his 40s who's never altered his brain chemically with any kind of, uh, any kind of substance outside of alcohol and nicotine, me, I can feel it and I can connect to the divine with this music the same way that I could with Grateful Dead. Anyways, I don't really know where I'm going with that speech, but I just think it's an interesting thing because I've spent so much of my life around druggy musical culture without ever participating in that druggy part. And I just wanna say it's possible. You know, Some of my best friends actually are straight edge fish fans, which is funny. It's not funny that they're fish fans. We'll see if we can work on that. But uh, just, you know, it really is quite possible. Okay, moving on. Boy, say, say no to drugs, kids. 2.02 uh, .02 Killer Year. Very clearly uh, kind of on the nose song about, uh, about, about pandemic. Okay. Very nice arpeggiated minor scale notes. And almost impossible. Like, this is one of the hardest songs to nod your head to, but you can. A little bit more woos on the second side. Woo! Great lyrics in the beginning. It's coming up, Beach Boys. I like that idea. Um, and then there's another voice. I think maybe a female vocalist on here, which is nice. And then leads right into the song, Black Hot, Black Hot Soup. At this point in the album, I get a little bit tired of the whole shtick of the sounds on here. I like that this song is guitar-led, uh, but you know, reality is a dream. It's a little too 
jam band lyric for me. It's all about how the universe is just black hot soup. It's okay, but I don't love it. Uh, really nice bits here with some clapping. And actually the ending reminds me of, like the ominous sounds of the ending remind me the most clearly of a kind of Radiohead jam. Ya love is the only song ya don't like. I just don't like this song. This song, I just don't like. The only song I don't like some organs, which are kind of nice, but the, the guitar feels a little bit forced in its weirdness and time signature changes and maybe even key signatures. I don't like the lyrics. You love, you love. I just don't like it. But it's okay. It's okay. If, you're, if you love this song, if this song is your jammy jam, feel free to write in the comments, Professor, you don't understand nothing about King Gizzard and his Lizard Wizard because, okay. Uh, then it ends with Butterfly 3000, which is a beautiful song. Just a great ending to the whole album. A very sweet arpeggio. Apparently, this is about his daughter growing up and feeling like she needs to fly. And it's a nice ending to just a spectacularly enjoyable album. So, uh, it is uh, my weekend episode, which means that this is where I show off my Patreons. Um, I, I tried to print out a list, um, but I wasn't able to print out the list of my, of my Patreons. Uh, because my printer is like really like it doesn't work well, um, so this is this is these are all, all my patreons. Um, well, actually, this guy, this guy's at the top level, so he gets his own card. I printed this out like like a month ago. Thank you, Milos. Um, but uh, uh, so I couldn't print it out. And every time you have to print something, it doesn't work, and sometimes it does. And in order to do it, you have to use something called the Hewlett Packard. Uh, wireless setup wizard. So I've been calling this album all morning, King Gizzard and the Wireless Setup Wizard. <laughs> it's all worth it for that joke, damn it. So thank you to my Patreons. Uh, if you don't know, I don't take the money and use it to buy food. I take the money and I take every dollar that these folks have given me and I buy new music. I buy the music that I'm trying to support here. And hey, King Gizzard, if this album ever comes out on vinyl, you see these names right here? These are the people that are gonna give me the money to give you the money to keep supporting you with your awesome music. Okay. All right. Uh, my town is having a Juneteenth celebration, so I have to go do that. All right. Till uh, next time, there's the camera.